Hello and welcome to the CIPR International Podcast, sponsored by reputation management consultancy Lansons. I'm John Cronin, Head of Broadcast and Content at Lansons. Now, what can the world of PR learn from the world of international diplomacy? For both, effective communications and influential networks are, of course, essential. But the two hold more in common than we might think. That was the focus of a recent CIPR International Maggie Nally Memorial Lecture, presented by Dr David Landsman, a former ambassador and diplomat, and more recently, a former executive director of the conglomerate Tata Limited. David joins me in the Lanson studio now. David, welcome. First off, I guess I'd like to understand a bit more about yourself, about your background. Um, Fill us in on that. Okay, well, I start with uh, what I did at university. I started with classics, leave that perhaps for a moment to one side. But my PhD, my master's and PhD are in linguistics. Uh, and I studied modern Greek and I looked at uh, the way in which the politics of Greece in the 70s and 80s, I, I did my PhD back in the mid 80s, uh, the, po- the politics of the 70s and 80s affected the way the language was being used. It's a very combustible so, time in Greece as well, that. Well, it was because there was a, a, a huge reaction in the language uh, as well as in many other ways to uh, the uh, colonel's dictatorship, uh, 67, 74, uh, and then the restoration of democracy and, and, and a whole lot of other uh, political developments impacted on how people use the language, how it was taught in schools and so on. So that was my, uh, that was my PhD. So that was uh, looking at language and communication from the point of view of, 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 of linguistics. Uh, but also very much with a with a political side to it, uh, and then after a while in uh, Cambridge, I uh, moved on and joined the diplomatic service. And people say uh, about the Foreign Office, they used to say, you know, if you know anything about Russia, they'll send you off to China. Well, in my case, uh, uh, they they didn't do that. They they did the very logical thing. And my first posting was in Greece, in, in Athens, in the early nineteen nineties, and I spent uh, three and a half years there. Then. Uh, Funnily enough, as, as as things have turned out since uh, working mostly on the economy. But uh, you were ambassador there eventually. I was eventually ambassador. I, uh, so I went back in 2009. And and I thought when I arrived, you know, I'm, I'm now I'm the ambassador. I'm not the the, 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 the the grunt doing the economic work anymore. I won't think too much. I won't have to spend too much of my time doing the economy. I can do the grand politics and all the strategic stuff and all the rest of it. And I arrived at the beginning of 2009. And of course... Uh, by uh, the autumn of 2009, Greece was was fully into the to, to the, the sovereign debt crisis. Uh, so actually, I spent most of my uh, time in uh, Greece, uh, very much focused on the economy, the implications for well the eurozone and the EU, and obviously the uh, the UK had a huge interest, not just because we're uh, uh, involved as a member of the. Uh, IMF and as a as, as part of the European economy, whether you're in the EU or not, you're part of the European economy. But because um, you know, up to two million Brit- British people visit Greece every year, so there was a real interest uh, in the government. Uh, what would happen if Greece uh, left the eurozone? What would happen if the economy really collapsed? It didn't collapse. It was a, a huge crisis for the people and for the for the economy. But it, you know, the, the country is very much still. Uh, you know, got through it and has, 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 has survived that. But there was all those concerns. So that's actually what took up uh, a lot of my time in uh, in in Greece in the end. And um, it was a good lesson for me in terms of um, what I think the, the PR people call continuous professional development, because I came back to the economics that I'd been studying 20 uh, odd years earlier. And I found I, I, I needed to go back to school, as it were. So I did a, a distance learning course in international economics at that point, because I thought I needed to understand quite how the, uh, the IMF and uh, the other institutions uh, behave when countries get into, into trouble, what they do about it, what the background was, what all these IMF people turning up in, in Athens were, were, were about. So um, that's uh, so. My diplomatic career started in Greece, and it ended in Greece uh, twenty odd years later. And you left the diplomatic service eventually, and, and went into into business. Yes, um, I I'd spent a bit of time um, in uh, in business in between. I'd taken a break from the diplomatic service and, and worked uh, in business for a little bit earlier on. But then I decided after uh, I, I just couldn't really, you know, having started in Athens, ending in Athens, I couldn't really think of what what to do next in in, in diplomacy. I wanted to change while I was still young enough so um, at that point I I went off and and, um, Tata the uh, 
Indian-based uh, conglomerate uh, offered me the position of uh, managing director of the uh, European subsidiary of the holding company. So I suddenly got um, another very uh, wide range of experience uh, offered to me as a, an opportunity, as it were, in uh, business which covers everything from uh, salt to steel, as they say, or from tea, Tetley tea, through to IT, Tata Consultancy Services, one of uh, the world's largest IT services businesses. And I got involved a bit in all of those. Uh, from the perspective of the of the holding company, so that was a, a, another huge change. I guess I've always uh, liked variety. Being a diplomat, I was you know served in different countries, doing different sorts of work, and then with Tata, uh, had an opportunity to um, see uh, a wide range of businesses and you know, learn a huge amount about you know how you make money in uh, different ways and, and 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 how you can make successful and sustainable businesses in different ways so those two pillars then uh, of your uh, of your professional experience mm. uh, the the diplomatic service and then a senior role in business for an, an international uh, organization tata uh, that in many respects then feeds the thoughts that you've had and presented at the Maggie Nally Memorial Lecture 2019, which you delivered very recently. Uh, what were your thoughts when you presented there? What was the thrust of what you were trying to, to, to communicate? The, the, this link between diplomacy, which you have obviously a great deal of experience, and, and, and the world of PR? Well, um in the lecture, I, I mentioned that um, when I was in Greece, um, I'd gathered together a group of PR people from uh, from Greece, uh, together with some people from the Foreign Office focusing on communications. Uh, we sat down together and I said, you know, I think we're actually all in the same business. And people looked uh, at me a bit oddly as though I, I, I can't be right. But I think actually um, communication is what diplomacy is fundamentally about. Uh, and communication is what PR is fundamentally about. And to me, they both work well if you're thinking not about broadcast, but you're thinking about two-way communication. And you're thinking about really understanding uh, the people you're dealing with and trying to bring their world into your world so that you can communicate better. So if you're a diplomat... Uh, and uh, like, like when I was in Greece, for example, you're in a foreign country, you, you're the outsider... It's a really important part of being a diplomat is being you're an outsider, a bit like being a foreign correspondent. You didn't quite go native then in the end. Eh? Well, no, I think it's really important. Um, you have to understand, you have to be able to put yourself in the shoes of uh, the people you're working with without, if you like, going native. Uh, you have to remember who pays you, just as a PR has to remember who pays them. A diplomat has to remember which side they're on. Of course you do. I don't actually think there are many examples of diplomats going native. I think it's, it's a nice story. But um, but you do have to understand. And one of my rules uh, when I was a diplomat was don't assume that the other side are mad or bad, at least until you've uh, exhausted all the, the, the other options. Now, of course, there are people who are mad and bad. Um, but try and understand where they're coming from, why they're doing what they're doing, who's the constituency they're talking to, why they think this is the, the way to, to achieve what they want to achieve. Because even if you come to the conclusion in the end they're, they're, they are mad and they're bad and they have to be resisted and we need to protect ourselves against them, and I guess that's true, that can be true in corporate PR as much as it can in diplomacy, you still more likely to do it well if you've really understood them. Because if I just look at you and say, oh, you're bad, and no, no point in talking to you because you're just bad, that's not going to take you anywhere. So, so would you say then that that <clears throat> is one of the fundamental lessons that communications, that public relations, that reputation management can take from the world of, of diplomacy? You were a diplomat at a very uh, difficult, acute time in the Balkans, not just uh, Greece, but elsewhere as Yugoslavia, the former Yugoslavia. Uh, is that a key learning then that communicators, PR professionals can take from diplomacy? Well, I think I think it is. I, I had what I must say was a, a slightly heretical view uh, as a diplomat that you should be prepared to talk to almost anyone. Um, don't start ruling people out. Certainly don't ignore what they're saying um, just because they're bad. Um, doesn't mean that you like them. It doesn't mean you're giving them your seal of approval. But you have to try and understand where they're coming from. And so, uh, for me, uh, this business of being the outsider, and I suppose in a way, um, 
that's my weakness or strength uh, throughout my career, because as a diplomat, you are an outsider. As somebody who came into business from having been in the public sector for quite a long time, you do see things a bit from an outside perspective because you've got different experience. But I think everybody can be an outsider in one way or another. And if you're uh, PR working uh, in all sorts of different industries and for all sorts of different people, you can place yourself as the outsider and you can help the organisation see itself from the outside. Um, we need to do that. We have our... I mean, another one of my lessons is we, we, we all have our public lines. And in government, my goodness, you have public lines. And in uh, as a business, you'll have your, your, your branding and you'll have your statements about yourself. Of course you do. And of course you should. And you need to believe in them. But you also need to have an internal debate. And you need to be open. Because if you're going to try and... If you're going to say, well, we are, uh, we are the best, which of course you are. Of course we're the best. Of course we're going to say we're the best. But you have to watch the competition, see where it's creeping up, and you have to be open to the idea, well, maybe we're not the best anymore. Maybe we're in danger of being uh, overtaken. What are we going to do about it? So it's looking at things from the outside. And um, organisations, I mean, governments, businesses, are s can be so insular, can be so inwardly focused on their processes, on the silos, on the internal politics, if you like, and to bring that kind of breath of fresh air in from the outside and challenge, uh, I think that's a, that's that that that's what, to my mind, a good good diplomacy does. Government, and of course, can be very, as you say, insular in large organisations. Uh, governmental organisations uh, can uh, can suffer from that, as of course can big business, large multinational organisations, of which. Uh, Tata was one that uh, that you were a senior member of until um, fairly recently. Were there lessons from the time as a diplomat and how you were transposing those into communications that you used at your time uh, at Tata when you were on the board there? I think that um, one of the things you just have to do is to try to understand where people are coming from. And sometimes people will... Uh, They'll, they'll react in a way you don't like. They'll react negatively to a proposal you're making or uh, they'll see things from a different perspective. And the temptation is always, think, oh, this is just a nuisance. Let's kind of bat it out of the way. Let's work our way around it or whatever. But actually, if you try to, if you try to look um, as though your colleague in a different division is actually, as it were, from a foreign country, whether they are or not, it's not the point. But it, it is as though that you, you're, you're looking in, you're saying, well, where are they coming from? What are they doing? And, um, and Tata's a very complicated organisation, as you said earlier on, everything from tea bags to Land Rovers to steel. A $100 billion business um, in over 100 countries and um, all, different, uh, all different industries. Um, yeah, it's a very complex business. And, of course, when you are, for example... Um, in uh, the UK, and you've got um, people working in uh, different uh, businesses. There's a focus on the employees and on the communities. Uh, you know, for other people in the organisation in other other places, there might be a focus on the shareholders, and the shareholders might not understand why you've got the the interest you have in the particular businesses. So there's all, there's so many different perspectives, and they need to be brought together. And sometimes seeing them from the perspective of uh, seeing, seeing them from, a, uh, from, from, from the outside and then, well, why are they doing that? They're not daft. It's not wrong to be focusing on this issue. It's not wrong to be challenging it. But why are we doing it? And I think, and to me, I mean, I, I guess we all, uh, we all use our backgrounds in, in various ways to, to interpret the situations we're put into. But for me, looking at things from that outside in perspective I think is, 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 is hugely valuable for me and I think it, it, it adds another dimension. Now, another point that you covered during your lecture presentation was this notion around professionalism, particularly uh, within the PR industry. Professionalism actually being a profession, seeing uh, the industry seeing itself as a profession. Now, you're sceptical about that. I'm interested to know why. Surely... Uh, PR professionals, reputation managers, should be seeing themselves and seeking to be professional. Absolutely, and I've got some um, good friends in the industry who uh, I know are working very hard to make PR into a profession. Now, of course, um, 
good people aspire to be professional and they aspire to be ethical. And, 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 and I'm, of course, I'm not saying that's a, that, that, that's a mistake. Uh, I guess where I'm, I, I'm raising the question, be careful what you wish for, is around the idea of being a profession and thinking somehow there's a, a, a goal to be achieved, which is that we are recognised as a profession. And then I guess what you're saying is you're saying, well, we'd like to be a bit like lawyers or we'd be like to be a bit like accountants because they are sort of respectable professions with a corpus of knowledge and all sorts of qualifications and letters after your name and institutions and so on. Of course, CIPR itself is a, is a, is a very respectable institution. Um, but... Um, I'm just not sure that's quite the right approach, and for a couple of reasons. One is because um, from some of the, 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 the sort of research that I've done, um, I, I, I do have questions about the professions as exclusive as well as inclusive. That's to say, as organisations which define themselves quite narrowly put themselves a bit into silos, want to you keep people out by the jargon and by the qualifications and so on. As well as promoting excellence, there's also that kind of protection. And I think that's under challenge because we're in a, in a less deferential age. We're also very much challenged, if you like, by uh, technology, by AI and so on. So a lot of that specialist knowledge is anyway going to be automated. So I wonder whether, in a sense, trying to be that kind of a profession is going is fighting last year's war, as it were. The, I think a new approach is, is 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 possibly better, and the kind of approach again that I'm I'm suggesting is focusing on being that outsider, being that critical voice, bringing being the one that promotes the two way dialogue. Because it seems to me one of the things that governments need and business needs more and more is to understand the. Uh, outside world. That's why there's such a growth in, in reputation management, if you like, and why reputational crises um, can be really devastating. You need to understand the outside world. Organisations which are structured and focused into all sorts of silos and, and professions, if you like, within them, often quite internally focused, need that help to understand the world outside. If you've got a board which is full of people who've worked in your industry all the way through... Um, they'll be infinitely more knowledgeable than the, the man or woman in the street about that industry, but they won't necessarily uh, have the uh, all the, the skills to understand what's going on outside. Did you see examples of that at Tata, for instance? I'm thinking in particular the motor automotive side of the business, uh, the automotive industry, uh, one that has a very strong structure, people who are in it for a, a lifetime, have great experience, and maybe not so much of other areas outside that business. Is that lack of looking from the outside in something that you saw in the automotive industry? Well, I think speaking uh, generally, I would say that uh, there are a number of industries where you can see that the the main, over the years, the main criterion for uh, being uh, uh, being in, uh, part of a, a board or senior executive leadership in a number of industries, I said automotive very generally is, is one of those, would have been a lifelong career in that industry. It makes sense. Um, you need to know, you know this is a really specialised business. You need people who understand it. Um, I, I, of course, I wouldn't say throw them all out. You'd, why on earth have you got automotive specialists in automotive? I mean, I'd be daft. Um, but you need something else. And I think the, uh, and I, I say the challenge to me, the huge opportunity for... PR for the profession, if you like, but for the for the practitioners, for the people who really get this sense of coming in from the outside and promoting the two-way dialogue, both at executive level and at the boardroom, is, is to bring that in because it's a dimension that every industry needs. I mean, just look at the huge disruption the automotive industry, just as one example is going through at the moment. Most of that, it, it, I mean, some of that is to do with technology, but it's usually technology from outside the automotive industry that is coming into the industry. Or it's it's the environmental concerns. It's all the other uh, all the other concerns which come from outside. So and you need to understand that, and you need it to be in your DNA to understand that. And uh, and, and of course the 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 the, the industries have you know the, the, the industries are, are, are catching up. And are, but I think you can see that over the, over over the last few years it's been a process of catch up. Would it have been better? You know, we, we talk a lot about, quite rightly, about boardroom diversity these days. Would it have been better if we were there 20 years ago? I'm sure it would. But there's a real opportunity now, and I think PR could be an important part of that. One of the areas that you have focused on more recently is that of what's called 
human-centric transformation. A uh, bit of a mouthful, bit of jargon there, but maybe you can um, unlock a little bit of that. What, what does it mean? How does it, how does it work in practice? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry about the jargon, and you're quite right to call it out. Um, since I, I stepped down from Tarsha at the end of last year, I've, I've been um, taking up a number of different activities as a non-exec and as a consultant. And one of the things that I've done is I've been part of setting up a new consultancy called Agora Envisioning, which is uh, focused on what we call human-centric disruption. Um, and actually, it's very much related to what I've been talking about, to the idea of bringing the outside in, an organisation finding ways to break down the silos, not to be driven to producing what you want to produce, but given being driven to produce what people want from you. So um, human-centric disruption is about really understanding who is using your services, using in the broadest sense of the term, customers, your suppliers, your staff, uh, maybe your community, depending on what kind of a business you're in, really understanding who they are. Have you broken it down? Have you looked at whether uh, men and women use your services in the same way, whether people at different ages do with different circumstances do? Take a, a bank, for example. Um, we all might want a bank account, but do we all use a bank account in the same way? Do we want it for the same reason? None of us actually wants a bank account. We want a way of managing our money. And the most innovative, uh, the most in innovative, innovative organisations uh, will be focusing on not how other people have done it before, not on just another version of the same product, but on, on the, the people who are using it. Why uh, Why do we want this thing? What What do we want to use it for? What is it, what is it we really want to do? Then can I design something around that? Rather than, can I give you a service and then if it's a bit difficult to use, if the app doesn't work terribly well, if, if it's a bit complicated, well, we'll have a help desk or we'll do something to, to help you around that. So, so you're asking what people want rather than telling them what they need. Exactly. Um, now, if you're going to do that, you come up against uh, the faster horse uh, uh, conundrum. Uh, Henry Ford said, if I'd have gone out there and asked people what they wanted, they'd have said they wanted a faster horse. I had to be the genius who brought along the motor car for them because they'd never have worked that out for themselves. That's true. What, what we need to do, um, you can't just ask people, what would you like? Well, OK, you're a bank, so I suppose I want a bank account, don't I? That's, that's logical. What you need to do is to find ways, and behavioural science offers you all sorts of opportunities these days, to find ways to get under the surface and to find out what people really want, how, they're, how they really see the challenges that they face in their lives. And then you as an organisation can work out uh, how you can best meet those challenges. We call this human-centric because it starts with the... Uh, with the individual, with the users, um, and allows you to transform and be disruptive, not by saying, OK, I'd like to design an app. Let's sit down and design an app, and then we'll see how people use it. Say, so, well, what actually do people want? So, so there's a whole uh, a kind of a methodology around trying to tame the influence, if you like, of the organisation itself, so that the organisation really listens to its potential customers, its staff, uh, all the people around it, to see what it can do differently and better. So it's very much in the same spirit that I've been suggesting that there's a, the, the role for, for PR and for communications, if you like, for a kind of a corporate diplomacy, in, in, in listening and understanding, not because it's a, a kind of nice fluffy thing to do um, and, it, and it's not the real business and we'll let the real business get on with its own thing and we'll come in as PR when it's necessary. No, it's not that. It's because if you can actually reorientate yourself through a kind of human-centric disruption, if you can reorientate yourself to thinking about what, what do they really want, your competitors won't be doing that and you'll clean up. So it's, a, uh, it's another way... Of, um, of, of, of approaching the fundamental strategic question, what should we be doing as a business, as an organisation? And you're drawing, in some respects, on those lessons that you would have learned a few years ago now when you were in the diplomatic service and listening as you described earlier. Well, I tell you, um, I, I find this fascinating to, to kind of um, see how, how this is evolving because um, Agora Envisioning, I, 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 I started just a few months ago uh, with a partner who comes from a completely different world, from the from the world of design, 
and the built environment. And um, so you just said, well, there's not much you know, diplomacy and, and, a, and a bit of stuff in, in, in the business world on the one hand and, and design in the built environment on the other. What have they got in common? Uh, it might be fun to chat at dinner, but what are they actually going to have in common? Well, actually, these same kind of perspectives, bringing the outside in, looking at things from a different perspective, when you combine, and this is very much part of our, uh, our, 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 our mindset, when you combine different disciplines, you break down those silos and you start asking the questions you wouldn't otherwise ask. If we were both from the same background, I'm sure we would never ask any of these questions because it would all seem logical and obvious. And it's when things seem too logical and obvious that they start going wrong. David, it's a fascinating subject, but I'm afraid we're out of time now. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, John. Thank you.